All right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the movable feast <laughs> here. Um, I'm Joyce Robinson, Assistant Director here at the Palmer Museum of Art, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's talk by Joshua Frankel. This is, as you can already tell, somewhat of a hybrid venture, a gallery talk in the auditorium, in person, yet being recorded as a Zoom webinar, a project originated by the Center for the Performing Arts, enlivened by a satellite exhibition in the print study room on the second floor, and perhaps most hybrid of all, a visual artist talking to us about designing and directing an opera. Here's to cross-disciplinary hybridity and collaborative partnerships. Joshua Frankel is a visual artist working in a range of old and new media, including drawing, printmaking, public art, film, and animation. His projects often contain animation and physical works in conversation with one another, blending analog and digital processes. processes. A recurring theme in the physical works is the evocation of time, motion, and transformation, elements that are at the heart of the art of animation. Frankel's films often engage deeply with music and have been presented synchronized to live musical performances by chamber ensembles and full orchestra by institutions, including the Library of Congress, the San Diego Symphony, and New York City's River to River Festival. And of course, that merging of music, animation, and Frankel's artistic vision was amply evident last night at the world premiere of A Marvelous Order. I am still recovering, I know you are. <laughs> yeah. Just to say, I'm still recovering from the performance, so I can only imagine <laughs> for the performers and for Josh and family too. Josh, thank you for your work on this ambitious, truly marvelous production. And thank you for inviting us to glimpse part of your creative process in the cyanotypes on view upstairs and for sharing insights about these blueprints created in parallel with the visual development of the opera. So again, let's welcome Josh Frankel. Hi, hi everyone. So is this okay? Do I need to lean forward? Um, thank you, Joyce, and um, thank you, um, folks at the Palmer Museum and the Center for Performing Arts. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, um, and thank you, all my you know friends and family who are here too. Um, so I'll give a little bit of I'll show a little bit of other bits of my work to give a little bit of context. Um, as Joy said, my projects often include uh, close collaboration with music and each body of work um, often has a, col a collaboration between animation and music and also physical works. So this is a project that premiered just before the pandemic at peak performances at Mont sort of Montclair State University in New Jersey's version of the Center for Performing Arts here. And there was a, <clears throat> a piece uh, with six grand pianos and um, an animation synchronized to that. And to create the animation, I made a number of drawings. And so each drawing contained uh, multiple frames of animation, almost like a film score uh, for animation in a certain kind of way, uh, letting you experience the animation, trying, trying to give each shot in a film a physical form as an object and allowing you to consider a piece of motion with the same sort of patience and time uh, that someone making a film or making animation gets, you know, gets to experience it. Um, and this show had, there were drawings and then there were videos presented side by side. This is at standard space uh, near us, uh, uh, this gallery is in Sharon, Connecticut. In the opening, the composer I worked with on that, Missy Mazzoli performed live. Some people who are here might even be in that photo somewhere. <clears throat> um, but much more recently, uh, yesterday was the premiere of A Marvelous Order. Um, is there anyone here who was not in the theater last night? It's okay. That's right. 
you guys saw it the night before, so it was okay. Okay, good. So that gives me a sense of of you know how to how to talk about it and how much information um, I need to give. Uh, my collaborators on a marvelous order are composer Judd Greenstein and uh, a poet Tracy K. Smith, who subsequent to writing the libretto for this work became a uh, U.S. Uh, poet laureate uh, and served in that position for two years. My role is the, as a, is the uh, director of the work and also creating animation that runs throughout, just as there's music throughout in this opera, there's also animation throughout. And I, I've spent so much time with musicians and composers, I've begun to think about animation in certain ways um, that relate, I think, to how to musical composition. And I'm trying to tell the story, but also communicate feeling and emotion and develop motifs and then create variations on them as, as the piece progresses. Um, the, uh, the three of us work together to develop the story of the opera before we you know, put pen to page. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, you know, after we had figured out what in this history is in and what are we not focusing on and what are we adding to it, um, then we progressed to, you know, Tracy writing the libretto and Judd writing the music and, and me beginning to make images, which we did somewhat in parallel. And that allowed me to do, to say to Tracy, you don't need to communicate this piece of complex information about how Moses you know, was able to build, had the money to build all these things because I'm going to make animation of cars streaming through toll booths and everyone might not get the all the mechanics of it, but you get the sense a little bit. Um, and that frees her up to be a poet um, and, you know, use really spread her wings um, in ways that can be constrained in these situations otherwise. And it's pretty unusual for an opera to be conceived by three artists. Usually it's the composer and the librettist and the visual people get handed this thing that is baked and set in stone and we have to figure out how to manage that and um a time is very interesting in a film uh, the director controls time in an opera the composer controls time and so but storytelling time is very integral and so our collaboration was a conversation and it, it was much less hierarchical than opera usually is and it allowed me we know to have, have us have these conversations about which medium is going to do what when and allowed and through the creative generosity of, of Judd um, and also Tracy, we could have conversations about the storytelling and, and about time. And I think it's um, uh, I think that bears fruit and I think it feels really uh, powerful for visual art to have a seat at this table. And I think that's something important um, that we're trying to do. Um, so in tandem with the opera, I've been making a variety of images to figure out what this thing is going to be and also to have some things that can, you know, be permanent uh, and that you can touch um, alongside the uh, performance, which is inevitably ephemeral. Um, and so some of those are upstairs. There are Sanat types. This is one. Um, and they're in the, uh, well, some of you have been there, the print uh, and drawing study room upstairs right here. And that's what's gonna be the focus of the rest of this talk. This one is based on an eight millimeter film still of um, a woman posing in front of the Verrazano Bridge under construction. So you can see the cables dangling, but they're not yet supporting anything. And this is taken you know, along the, uh, by, the um, by the freeway there, uh, down, down along, the, the name of it is escaping me at the moment, um, in Bay Ridge anyway. Uh, Moses and Jacobs, you probably got some of this from the opera, Jacobs, um, but you know, we weren't making a documentary, so we didn't go in too much detail about the history. Jacobs uh, was a self-taught urban theorist, a, write, a journalist, a writer, a critic, um, and eventually went on to write um, some incredible books coming to understand what makes a neighborhood function. Why does this neighborhood have people in it um, and, and, and thriving, and why is this block empty? Um, taking what was seemed like chaos because it was so complex and revealing it to be driven by uh, by laws, by by things that we could understand um, and uh, inform decisions that, to make our neighborhoods and cities uh, more successful. Robert Moses, uh, the most perhaps the most powerful person in New York City, from the late 20s to the late 60s, built almost every bridge in New York City. Um, almost every highway and parkway, the housing projects, the, the public swimming pools, 
uh, beaches, um, playgrounds, um, even Shea Stadium, two World's Fairs, and uh, ruled New York City from an island fortress uh, on Randall's Island underneath or to the side of the Tribar Bridge using the tolls from his bridges to pay for the next bridge and then using the tolls from that one to pay for the next thing um, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Um, Act One is concerned with his proposed road through Washington Square Park, um, which would deliver Fifth Avenue to the developers building these buildings over here. And um, I spent much of my childhood in Greenwich Village. I played in playgrounds in that park. I trick-or-treated in those buildings. So um, uh, the story is personal for me. And my, and my collaborator, Judd, grew up um, on Mercer Street a few blocks. We met as adults, but we were both in those playgrounds at the same time as kids. And uh, the most famous book about Robert Moses, by, uh, by, uh, written by Robert Caro, Power Broker. And if you were watching the news during the pandemic, you might've noticed it in the background of uh, talking heads uh, all, you know, all over. And part of that is, is about the power of good graphic design and good book design, um, which I know is something a lot of people and certain people in this audience think a lot about, um, but also, Putting it back there sends a message to the audience that if I have this book on my bookshelf, I have an interest in how things work, uh, how things get done, how power is accumulated and wielded. Um, <clears throat> and so right now we're in a moment when what a city can be is being rethought. People are more open to making bigger changes faster. Um, uh, and questions of urban planning are being recognized more widely as questions of life and death. Uh, it's, it's the type of moment that may only arrive every few generations. Um, so it's, it's an important moment for this work. This is the, the book Jane Jacobs is most famous for, The Death of Life of Great American Cities, uh, which I mentioned uh, some of those ideas, what makes one neighborhood um, vibrant and another not. Um, so some images from the last time we performed the opera, photographs from last night are not in the, in the presentation just yet, uh, but, but you guys, so, uh, so this this we last night we did a swap uh, due to a football season uh, schedule change. Um, the gentleman who here is in the screen performing Al Smith became our Moses, and the last time uh, Deshaun was our Robert Moses, and he became Governor Al Smith in the screen. <clears throat> um, oh, here you can see on the floor the spike marks. So the the, the cast is constantly rearranging these blocks, um, creating and destroying their environments, and spike marks, which is a part of stagecraft, becomes part of the stage image, and that reappears later in the science types, which you'll see. Uh, we're here, this is our third residency at Penn State, our first one focused on choreography for the ballet of the street. And we, uh, so we worked on that choreography here, I shot footage of it, and then I made animation based on, um, based on that footage. This is, the animation changed since this is work in progress for it. Uh, it looked a little bit different last night. Uh, but this relationship with Penn State, multiple residencies over multiple years uh, made this project possible in this way because animation takes time. So this project had to be spaced out over time in order to become what we wanted. In 2021, we were here recording the chamber ensemble um, uh, at the music department, which was invaluable and would become the basis of a studio album. And last night, you guys were all there. Um, so cyanotypes, um, let's talk about those. This, that's Jane Jacobs' actual window uh, at 555 Hudson Street in the center, surrounded by other windows uh, from Greenwich Village, all photographs that I shot. Um, I included some boarded up windows because it's hard to, it's hard to remember in 2022, the Greenwich Village wasn't always um, so uniformly pretty and the houses were always all fixed up. Uh, it was uh, more of a mixed bag for a lot of, uh, uh, for a long time. Um, so what is a cyanotype? Anyway, that's one of the first photographic processes ever invented, 1842, three years after the invention of the daguerreotype. And its most famous practitioner uh, probably remains Anna Atkins, who began working with it um, almost immediately upon its invention, uh, making wonderful images um, of things she found in the natural world. More Anna Atkins. It's, it's, it's science, um, but it is also very much art. And pretty quickly it was realized that this process had commercial applications because you could reproduce images, make copies of them. 
uh, fairly easily. And so that's why we call blueprints blueprints, because the early ones were done made were using this process. So it's a it was a natural medium. I think it's beautiful. It's well suited to my process and suited to this story. Um, the way you do it is you, in a dark room, you coat paper with a chemical, which includes cyanide. Um, but as long as you don't drink the chemical, you're fine. <laughs> you put a stencil on it and expose it in the sunlight. None of these are me, by the way. These are, uh, I found them online, but it looks pretty much exactly like what I do. Um, so it's exposed with sunlight and developed in water, uh, which I think is quite a beautiful thing. Um, and so I made these cyanotypes in using sunlight and water in the place where I live now, which is Wasaic, New York, um, uh, which is also home to the Wasaic Project. My wife here is one of the co-founders of it. Um, come say hi. Uh, and this field in front of that old livestock auction barn is where I've um, exposed most of my cyanotypes to the sun. <clears throat> um, so this one is uh, children playing at Jones Beach, uh, Mo Robert Moses' first project, uh, the largest public beach the world had ever seen. And I went to Jones Beach while researching uh, the opera and hung out there and uh, shot some footage of people playing in the beach. And I pointed the camera towards the sun and time went away. You know, it, it could, could have been any time. Um, and uh, I, I like that. Um, you know, because this is a story that takes place at a certain time, but it also takes place uh, all over the world all the time. Um, and also this image is all about sunlight and it's kind of fun and water. And it's kind of fun that it was made with sunlight and water. One of my first um, explorations for the visual language of the set, I took pictures of um, uh, Robert Moses built housing projects and middle-class housing and just collected what they look like in the top view. And each, each housing project across New York City or middle income housing, all the different types, they tend to have their own distinct uh, shape when seen in the top view. So I collect them, line them up to try to figure out what that, what that language would be. Um, <clears throat> we end up in a place with the smaller units where each block would have a single right angle and the other angles would be off angles. And what that this is in a top view, this is not, this is just a work in progress image. What that means is if something like that in the top view, you can rotate it. So the right angle is facing downstage and the audience feels like they're seeing the language of Robert, the Robert Moses built environment. If you rotate it so the off angles are facing the audience, it feels like the language of Greenwich Village, which is old, you know, streets at off, connecting at off angles. Um, this is from Williamstown, and you can see a little bit of these mixed languages and, and uh, some of shapes that have the, the single right angle in various places. <clears throat> um, I talked about this one already. Uh, another thing this points to is her idea of eyes on the street. Um, what makes a neighborhood safe is having uh, people there. And that means that having a bar in the neighborhood often makes a neighborhood safer. If you think of um, a walking down a block that is empty, versus walking down a block at night that has people on it. And so if you have restaurants, bars, theaters, reasons for people to be out at night, that neighborhood's gonna be safer at night. Um, in near the end of act two, there's um, also this thing that happens where Jane is looking at the windows starting to turn color as the sun is rising. And that's um, some, uh, something I remember, um, you know, sunrise or sunset, seeing the, the sun bounce off of windows, probably more sunset, uh, is our apartment faced west. Um, and that's it also reminds me of leaves changing color, uh, sort of which we have outside here as well. So these windows do a variety of things over the course of the opera. And at the end of act one, Jane Jacobs appears in them. And then later she splits up the windows split apart. There's also a kind of a sunrise early on, which is made from uh, this is made from a map of Greenwich Village. So these are all this is I can't really tell you which street is which, but uh, as I made it a while ago, but these, these, these are actual blocks um, in Greenwich Village. Eyes on the streets, also a little creepy. Like it's a little bit like the surveillance state. Um, and um, eyes on the street can also keep people out and keep things the same, uh, which is sort of a darker side to that idea. <clears throat> but the best version is when the eyes on the street represent a diversity of viewpoints as opposed to them all. Um, having the same viewpoint. That's what can keep new ideas out. Uh, another science type upstairs is uh, based on Venetian blinds, the light pouring through Venetian blinds in my bedroom on 10th Avenue. I, the trucks would go up 10th Avenue 
the light would come through the Venetian blinds and create this shadow play on the ceiling of, you know, it had a very particular acceleration to it based on the passing of the truck. And um, that felt like uh, a good moving image to have in the opera. It feels like Robert Moses reaching uh, his hands into your bedroom window. Um, I live here. So this image, um, there's animation based on this that appears in the opera, and it is based on an actual blueprint for the Lower Manhattan Expressway, the MTA Special Archive, where they keep all the Moses stuff. They let me in. I got to touch it with my own hands. And here you can see actual, um, I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to walk over. These are like actual tenements, you know, or, you know, these are places where people live. And this hard line is where the highway would go. So each of these contains multiple family homes that would have been uh, torn down to make way for the 10 lane highway. Um, so I put, I live here in those, in those spaces. <clears throat> Jane Jacobs uh, with the button. Um, and, you know, um, unlike, I think she's, I think she's, I have a hard time coming up with like how superlative to get. I, I don't think I, I can't, I don't even, you know, one of the greatest thinkers humanity has ever produced maybe. Um, but in, she wasn't just in an ivory tower. She was also in the street, you know, she wasn't uh, only behind her typewriter. But she, her ideas are complicated and hard to achieve. And I think um, embedded in this image is actually a little bit of a critique I'm not an expert on uh, Cuban history or communism, but I think I get the sense that um, she gets flattened. And I think there are people wave the flag of Jane Jacobs, whether it is um, a developer saying that they're doing something in her spirit or a NIMBY protester saying, you know, don't build this thing here. You know, people will wave her banner while not um, engaging with the deep complexities of, of her writing in full. Uh, so Moses drew red lines across across maps to show where he would put his highways. <clears throat> and I, so I wanted to imagine what it would be like to drive down the Lower Manhattan Expressway had it been built. Um, and so this appears a few times. It, the footage is shot out the front of the Third Avenue L, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, um, by the filmmaker D.A. Pennebaker in a short film. And um, so I you know, can I play it again. Well, in any case, um, well, there we go. So I just put a red line, I put a red shape over the train tracks. So you can't see that it's those train tracks there. Um, and you're sort of moving at around the right height of, of what that highway would have been in not the exact neighborhood, but a neighborhood that has similar architectural feeling. <clears throat> and there's something fun to me about representing what Moses wanted to do using mass transit and Moses did not fund <laughs> mass transit. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an image of the spike marks I talked about. Um, this is based on a photograph I shot from the balcony in Williamstown. I shot a similar photograph yesterday at the Center for Performing Arts, the Eisenhower Coliseum, and it's the blueprint for the show. Um, giant scissors are just really fun. Uh, <laughs> you know, just the absurdity of celebrating these big things. And this one I, I hand painted, so it's a science type, and I added a hand painting in red of uh, this guy is um, a silk screen on top. Um, so I, I haven't talked about all of them, but there's more up there. There's little bits of writing up there, um, but there's a bunch. And here's a little animation um, that can accompany us uh, for a conversation if anyone has any questions. Oh, actually, wait, I think I feel like, wait, I have more. This is in the wrong, the slide's in the wrong order. I'll come back to that. Um, oh, I see. I see what's happening. I wanted to talk about talked about that one. This one is this is one is from an actual Moses pamphlet. You can see the literal lines that he's drawn around blocks to be torn down. He says new recreation area for one of those people's homes. Um, and uh, th this one, uh, these, this is. If you're not a New Yorker, uh, the one that's second from the right is a fire alarm pole. And uh, these guys are kind of like a sundial in the opera, um, showing time passing. And they sort of just feel, feel like old friends. <clears throat> they also kind of remind me of in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Um, that movie, as you might know, is follows the rules of Greek 
drama, the ancient rules of Greek drama that, you know, go back to Aristotle or before. And these three guys are like the Greek chorus in that film, um, uh, you know, talking to the characters and echoing what's going on. And so these guys kind of remind me of that a little bit. Um, and also an image that is um, made with about sun and time and made with sun and time. And here's one of the shots that appears in one of the bits of animation that appears in the novel, which you might have seen a few times. Um, all right, back to this. Any questions? Yeah, Moses was skeptical of mass transit. Um, he was really making New York City ready for the automobile. Um, and it's it's important to remember that when he begins working, there's a lot more horses in the streets used for transportation, um, pulling things. Um, and if you wanted to drive, this is the more meaningful, the more New York City geography you know, but if you wanted to drive from the Bronx to Queens, or say from Westchester to Long Island, you had to take the 59th Street Bridge and you had to stop at every traffic light along the way. Um, and he, you know, got into his head, I think, my, you know, I think he got into his head that project and tried to make New York City and the metropolitan region work for the car. Um, but he did not, and he did not. Uh, he was not very interested in mass transit. And he was excellent at getting, in addition to the, the toll booths money I mentioned, he was excellent at getting federal funding. When the Eisenhower Interstate Program was um, being done, he was first in line. He had the application, you know, set up with everything that they needed. Um, and he was so good at getting money for things that other people, other agencies, projects did not get money because he was hoovering it all up. Um, and so in the 70s, when New York City's mass transit system starts to be in pretty rough shape, that's because in part it was starved for cash and not making maintenance repairs when it should have been, in part because of Moses. In, in the live performance, uh, the conductor has a click track, a, a metronome uh, in his ear, and the other performers can choose to have that or not. Most of them don't <clears throat> um, on stage. Uh, the instrumentalists, some of them more of a higher percentage, but not all. So the conductor keeps it, keeps it in line. Yeah. Yes. So Judd is composing using a software that a lot of composers use now called Sibelius. It's industry standard standard. And so that can export um, a kind of synthetic version of the score. It sort of sounds like it's being played on like 1980s synth synths. And so I, I get that and I work to that. And then I have Judd attempting to speak slash sing the words. So I know what words are being, I can look at the score and tell what words are being said at what time, but I can't look at the animation and the score at the exact same time. So I need to have the vocal reference point. So um, anyone who was in the theater during tech rehearsals might've heard Judd's, uh, Judd attempting high notes uh, while we were, you know, teching through things, yeah. Okay, that was, that was I'll show another. So this is this this one that we just watched was based on um, footage that I shot um, in uh, on a street in New York City. And so I took each of the characters in um, that piece of animation, and then later in the opera in the protest scene, uh, I start to offset them and put set them into patterns. And what Jane Jacobs is doing is she's like you know looking at these things that seem like chaos and discovering patterns that underlie them. So um, I'm sort of doing that in backwards here, taking you know these little clips of animation and then setting them in, into patterns, you know, as the villagers organize themselves into an activist movement. Oh, yes. Um, so I know this opera has been in the world for I was just wondering if you could speak about like where this idea came from and what you had to do with what you were doing about the process. 
Sure. Uh, well, we were working on a, we've had a number of collaborations that have gotten bigger and bigger over the years. And on an earlier project, um, you know, it was going really well. And, you know, we were discussing what to do next. And Judd was at, at his career as a composer is going well. And he's at a point where he naturally begins to think about, well, should I be thinking about an opera? It seems like I should be thinking about an opera now, but what would that mean now, you know, in the 21st century? Like, why would I do that? And um, a bartender we know suggested this story. And he said, what do you, what do you think about this? And, you know, we both, as I said, we're both, you know, Greenwich Village is part of our childhoods. So it felt personal. And for me, as an animator, um, I felt like it was a story that would be very hard to tell without um, images like this that allow you to see the world from multiple perspectives and have lots of people on stage like this. Um, uh, epic structures, it seemed a, a story that needed animation and um, uh, and I was also interested in our collaborations that combined animation with live musical performance. I was very interested in expanding beyond a single channel, a single frame, uh, moving into multiple channels of images at the same time was something I was hungry to do. And this seemed really well suited to that. So it fit us personally and it fit the art that we wanted to make. Um, we're talking to, you know, pretty exciting places that you might guess in New York City. Um, and we're supposed to be in Sweden and Ireland uh, next summer. Um, none of that is like hard finalized, but should be soon. Fingers crossed. In in the opera on stage. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can find an image uh, here that will help me explain. <clears throat> so all the way upstage in the back, that's projection. Uh, there's a big projector hanging above the stage. And then there's three objects that have LED screens built into them, small, medium, and large. So there's a small one back there, a medium on the left side of frame, and then the tower on the right side of frame. And those have LED screens built in. Uh, we were, the earliest workshops for this project were um, hosted, produced by an organization called Three-Legged Dog, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, but that was in Lower Manhattan and was very interested in the intersection of performance and technology. So we were, uh, before that, we did a residency at Sundance, and the Sundance folks knew Three Legged Dog, and they did a kind of matchmaking thing for us. And it was a very nice fit. Three Legged Dog was actually located in the last building Moses ever built, which was the Battery Parking Garage, and the ground floor has uh, had an art space, had been converted to an art space. And so they had, you know, have uh, uh, new create creative technologists, people who are interested in using technology creatively. So these screens aren't like things you could buy from Panasonic. It's a couple of guys soldering, buying parts from China and soldering them together uh, and doing so at a very, very high level. Yes, sure. Sure. And this this is that is one of those, it's an earlier version of the same scene. Um, the image on the site changed uh, as well as the performer. So I wanted be, with screens and live people, I wanted there to be conversation between them and to, to you know have things flow from one to the other. So I wanted to have moments where we had them singing, but I didn't want to do a live feed um, because I was very limited in how I could embed that into my design. And also there's a delay, which I find jarring. So for these moments, I shot footage of the performers singing, and the footage of them is then becomes part of the animated collage. So what you hear is their live voices, and then we're just playing the animation behind them. And the there's a there's a conductor keeps it keeps it in sync as well as there's a monitor that they can see that's behind you that has some tricky hints uh, for them too. Um, I'm curious, um, this story feels like really relevant like this year and right now, but it's been such a sort of long process for you and it's 
probably meant something really different when we first sort of thought of it. Can you talk about how you're thinking about Robert Moses and James and his stuff like James over the years? And mm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, I mean, it be, I think it begins with. I think for Judd and I growing up in New York City in the 80s, when not a lot was happening in New York City, like the city felt relatively static. The idea of change, the landscape changing quickly was uh, sort of magical. Um, and the idea of, um, you know, of like things being able to get done was really interesting. And the impact of, um, of these things that he built and the problems of you know housing projects and green space that has no one in it and being next to freeways you know uh, and not having access to the waterfront I, I think it, i think it began from a lot of care about this the specific urban planning questions and um uh as well as like our love for the place and love for Grand Village. That's the, the maple seeds, the falling maple seeds are like something that I think about when I think about my childhood and uh, my, those, those times. Um, but I think that, <clears throat> um, well, when, when, when um, no, I'm gonna, I'll, um, I, I think the activism aspect uh, really is the thing that um, am changed a lot. Um, you know, there is, it was always a story about activism, but I think that took on, um, much more power in, in recent years. Um, and it, we, we've tried, I mean, it, this is a story about the problems of activism and Moses's world is very hierarchical. You know, it's like, it's a pyramid and there's, he gives orders and people follow the orders. And then the villagers are a mess. It's like herding cats and somehow to push back they sort of need to form a hierarchy and so you, you, you sort of start to almost become like the thing they're fighting against in a certain kind of way um occupy happened when did occupy happen i think occupy has been in our minds too and i think that um the aesthetics of um uh the way they would stand in a circle and repeat each other because they had no microphones um uh, that someone would say something and everyone nearby would repeat it at Occupy Wall Street and then the next circle out, circle out repeat that. Um, I think that makes an appearance um, in, in the work as well as a kind of anti-hierarchy. And um, so in act one, you know, Jane Jacobs sort of becomes a leader of a movement, but then in act two, the movement sort of subsumes her and it becomes this much this sort of partnership between uh between her and this group of people who are not necessarily totally like following her orders you know they become um an even greater power um can you talk about what happened? I know a little bit about it, but not about it. what happened to each of them after this? Uh, well, um, Jane Jacobs' second, uh, the middle kid, the, uh, the son, uh, the, there's an older son, and the middle one is also a son, <clears throat> uh, turned 18 and was not college. He was not, uh, school wasn't his thing. Uh, so he was going to get drafted. So, um, uh, Bob Jacobs was an architect. He got a job in Toronto and they moved to Toronto. So she defeats Moses three times. The opera sort of makes it two, but uh, she, you know, she defeats Robert Moses three times and still there's, it still has to deal with um, her family being forced to do things it doesn't want to do, live in ways they don't want to live. So they moved to Canada and then she moves in, she moves to Toronto and then goes on to fight um, against the Spadina Expressway and like, the exact same thing happens to her and then she does it again and so she's an enormous hero in toronto also uh, and then she goes on to write books about economics and economics of cities that are um fascinating robert moses eventually <clears throat> loses power um people eventually get you know it's a, a variety of reasons a variety of straws i guess uh but he is the uh, it's ultimately 
there was a little bit in the opera about bonds and those bonds he sold are sort of a, a central mechanism for his power. And um, he's eventually undone when Nelson Rockefeller is the governor. Uh, Moses holds 12 jobs at once, half for the city and half for the state. So if you fire him from one, he still has all the others. And he has his own source of money through these tolls and these bonds. And they finally are able to get rid of him when Nelson Rockefeller is the governor and his brother is the chairman of Chase Bank, which owns the largest amount of the bonds. And that's how, and, and that's what it took. So, did he die demoralized and helpless or? Uh, I, well, I don't know. I mean, um, I think that the, the book, um, it's, well, this book is published obviously before I was born, but my understanding is that like we sort of take for granted our understanding. Our understanding of Moses is really rooted in this book. But before this book was written, no one knew this stuff. So um, uh, this book was published around five years after he was out of power and utterly transformed how he was thought about. And there's a, in the biography of Jane Jacobs, there's a fantastic scene of Bob and Jane sitting in bed reading galley copies like side by side of, of this book. <laughs> <laughs> can't can't fit it all in there. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's um, to swing, if you swing too hard in either, it, I mean, you know, now in the Bay Area, for example, there is, I mean, there's problems building affordable housing all over America from the biggest cities to, you know, the hamlet in Dutchess County where I live. And, um, and particularly the Bay Area has a particular problem with transportation and with people um, who will vote Democrat, like left down the line, however they identify, you know, when you're in conversation and on the ballot. But when it comes to, you know, can we build affordable housing next to this mass transit station, they get out in the street and they stop it. And um, uh, so, in a, this, in, in a crazy way, there, there is a way of looking at this where Moses is the progressive and Jacobs is the conservative. Um, you know, libertarians love Jane Jacobs. And I, I think that um, there are lots of people, as I said, see Jane Jacobs and they see just a certain slice, a certain dimension. But she says the government should stay out. We're going to figure this out ourselves. And that's how it's, this neighborhood's going to be, become vibrant. And Moses says we should use the power and resources of the government to build things that the people need. And if a few people protest, they're getting in the way of the good of the many. Uh, now, I don't think we should do it the way that he did it. Um, but um, but I do think that uh, we need to figure out how to build better transportation and more affordable housing.
powerful and and important you know, so it's not great to you know about how how such a complex scenario a lot of life, you know, is really able to hold hold it in this way, you know, in the novel that I think I, I should say that you know the the Rockefeller anecdote is interesting, but it, it, I don't want to um, overstate it. It wouldn't have gotten to that point. That would have never happened, I think, if not for the stories of Jane Jacobs and other related stories. That wasn't out of the blue. By it, it, you know, she was instrumental in getting that moving. It was just they, it's just interesting that that's the nature of what the final blow was. Um, uh, transportation. Um, it, 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 there's a lot about family in the opera. I think that her work is really about. She thinks about neighborhoods and neighbors and people you have connections with on on the street that you interact with. And some are family, and some are friends, or some, as Tracy said, are uh, we aren't friends, but we're not strangers. Um, but, but she does it well. There might be other. I haven't read all of her books, so I can't speak about. Jane Jacobs in mass transit, um, really. Uh, but I can tell you that she commuted by bicycle when she was an uh, associate editor at uh, a prominent architecture magazine. I don't want to say the wrong one, but the office was in Midtown, and she biked from the West Village up there long before any of our bike lanes. Um, uh, your question, there were many parts of your, of your question. Okay. Contemporary, you know, I, uh, what happened what happened in New York City in, in the pandemic, all these parking spots got reclaimed for cafes and restaurants and some of them for public space. And I think that is that is uh, magical, the city taking back this land um, that is being used by so few people. Now, if it's all given to restaurants, then, well, you know, then it's privatized, which is also a problem. Um, but that's a, a key example of um, contemporary question that relates to all this. I invite you to go upstairs and see the sanitation. Can perhaps continue the conversation? Yeah. Sure. So obviously, we all are happy to keep talking about this. And um, let's thank Josh again. Um, 